the reading section. I'll talk about every single one, all 52 of them if I have to. But I want to make sure I give you as much individual attention as possible. So what's the first item? Anything before five? Number three. Well, it's part of a tandem. So this is important. Let's walk through the tandem strategy, right? So step one. What's step one? What is that first question? How are we going to articulate that first question? What I have here is reading tip notes that I had you take, and I wrote them out myself so that you can compare your notes versus these notes, because I want you to be very specific. On the second sheet that I'm giving you is the, the five steps for the tandem pair. And since that's our first question today, it seems important I should hand this out now, because I want to walk through these five steps. And the more disciplined we are with these five steps, I, I would say probably 90% of my students have eliminated 90% of their errors in the tandem pair. So let's. It takes a little bit to get used to, you know. It, it takes a little bit of practice to get used to applying it effectively. So it'll take us a little bit, that's fine. We need to practice. But let's walk through these five steps, and I want you to be able to look either in your notes or on the sheet I'm just giving you to make sure that you can see step by step how we arrive at the right answer. And, and, and it's almost foolproof, I want to say. I mean, there, there are certain little twists here that can prevent us from getting it. But um, if we walk through on the second page each of those five steps, we should 95% of the time end up with the right answer for both. Or both. So step one, as you said, was what is that first question? How could we rephrase this as a question? How do other people see Lady Kalara? How do other people see Lady Kalara? Yeah. From the point of view, so let's go through our perspective questions. From the point of view of the passage. So that kind of leaves it open, but it's but it's also got to be the passage mentioning other people about. So that's pretty simple. That's easy. But then we ask step two, are there any other potential disqualifiers woven into the question that we better be sensitive to? Perspective, time, and quantity, degree. What is it? That's their favorite, right? Singular, plural. If you find out what one person thinks about her, that's not the answer. So I would absolutely key in on people. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I got to be plural. I, I, I see that. <clears throat> and um, I don't see any timing or degree in the question. There could be timing and degree in the answer, potentially, you know, in the lines maybe. But that's what we that's what we do. We examine the question itself first. Then, next step, we'll go into the lines. So let's go to question four, and let's read those lines, 10 to four. And we're going to be thinking, point of view, about what people, plural, watch the plural. Line 10, it says, certain of her acquaintances will want to get her preventable admonition as to the undesirability of interfering on behalf of a distressed animal, such interference being none of her business. Wow. Some big language in there. But... Is it from the point of view of other people? Plural. Acquaintances? Plural. That's good. Is it about Lady Carlotta? Yes. Okay. So we've met our perspective and quantity disqualifiers. So we have to say this therefore provides an answer. So if this is the answer, what step four say? got to use words from those lines. Now, there's a lot of language in there that may be challenging to you, you might not know. So here's, here's the coaching point. Focus on the words in those lines you do know. In those lines, what are the words you do know? Interfering. 
Mind your business. We all know that, right? That's easy. So what do other people think about her? What do other people think about her? They tell her, it's not desirable to interfere. It's none of your business. Let's take that. Okay, anything else? I think that's enough. It's not desirable to interfere. It's none of your business. And then you go compare that to the options. Outspoken, tactful, ambitious, unfriendly. Um, do we know what outspoken is? If we don't know what outspoken is, you know, this is where we can trip up even if we do everything right, if the vocab trips us up. But if we don't know outspoken, we don't know if outspoken means uh, could in any way connect with, and we know they're not going to use the exact same words. They're going to use something synonymous, they're going to use something figurative, they're going to use something more broad in general. Uh, but I compare people telling her, don't interfere, it's none of your business. If we know what outspoken is, we might know whether this provides an answer or not. If we don't, we leave it. I don't know, I'll leave it, and let's go on to B. Do we know what tactful is? Okay, that could be, you know, now we're running into vocab problems. So this is one of the limitations of your vocab, not of the strategy. We leave it. Do we know what ambitious is? Okay. If, she, if they say, don't interfere, it's none of your business, does that mean she's ambitious? No, it just means she's interfering. It doesn't mean she's ambitious. It doesn't mean she's unfriendly. It would be the opposite. It's like, get out of everybody's business. You're too friendly. So I would say hard strike on C and B, and I'd go back between A and B, and I'd flip a coin. But if we know the vocab, outspoken, you're speaking out, it's none of your business. That's what that's going to connect with. And hopefully you can see that. If not, maybe you landed on tactful. But if you landed on C or D, you didn't apply the strategy correctly. Wait, what is the definition of outspoken? So outspoken, if someone's outspoken, they just, they're just speaking their mind too quickly and too easily and too freely sometimes. And tactful would be the exact opposite. Tactful would be you know when to be you know, uh, quiet, you know when to speak, you don't, you don't interfere. You're, you're polite, you're, you're trying not to offend, you're being tactful. So anyway, uh, worst case scenario, we flipped a coin and landed on B. But if you apply the strategy, do you see where, where, why we should have been able to get A or B? Okay. Next question. Five. Number five. All right, this one here is, I would say, because of the language of the text, is going to be very hard to get. Uh, I will give you, uh, I think there's one little important takeaway here, but uh, most students read, are reading this and they're like, yeah, I didn't even know that was what was happening because of the language is so tough. But uh, let's read it, and lines uh, 14 and 15, but let's read it. Guess where the answer is probably not. Yeah, so let's read a little more contextually. And... Um, let me see. Uh, Phoebe, would you mind reading? Can would you mind reading it? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, from the beginning of the sentence? Please. Okay. Only once had she put the doctrine of non interference into practice when one of its most eloquent exponents had been besieged for nearly three hours in a small and extremely uncomfortable matron by an angry boar pig, while Lady Carlotta, on the other side of the fence, had proceeded with the watercolor sketch she was engaged on and refused to interfere between that boar and his prisoner. Okay, let's stop there. Can you give me a rough idea of what's happening? Does anyone have kind of a clue? She only, she only didn't interfere with someone else's business once when it posed her danger. Okay, so one time she didn't interfere. And what was the situation in which she didn't interfere? There was a boar attacking someone and the lady was stuck in a tree. She's on the other side of the fence. Yeah. Don't worry, I remember what you said. Thank you. So, would you call that ironic? Yeah. So here's your takeaway. Irony implies humor. Now, the humor might be lost on students taking the SAT because there ain't nothing funny, and I'm not yeah. even have to be taking the SAT right now, and all this vocab is a pain in my butt. But 
Irony implies humor. And so if you think one, like if, if you could have watched this play out in the movie, you'd have been chuckling a little bit because Lady Carlotta was like, no, no, I got, it's sort of like, I don't ever, have you ever seen in a movie or a cartoon where someone says, I'm gonna go inside, I'm gonna shut the door. No matter what you hear, don't you open that door. And they go in there and they're screaming for help and they're like, no, 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 I remember what you told me, I'm not opening the door. And you've never seen the cartoons I saw. Anyway, uh, there's some humor in irony. And as we read those lines, it reminded me to go back real quick, ask anyone who missed three and four, did anybody for three and four pick for three D and for four B? What did you miss? Well, actually, well, I got D, but then I got the room four, right? Hmm. I don't know. Okay. So the, I, I'm going to speak first to the D in um, 3 and B in 4. Uh, if you picked B in number 4, that she lost the friendship of the lady, what did you miss at what step in your five steps? You missed step 2, which was spot the disqualifier of singular plural, right? Because what one lady thought of her didn't answer my question. I just wanted to reinforce that and make sure we're, we're, we're more sensitive to the singular plural issue. Okay, <clears throat> so the answer for number five then should be, the, would be C. It's, it's humorous. Next. Number nine. Well, let's do it as a 10. Did you get 10? Yeah. Great. Okay, so let's see, let's see where the disconnect happens. If you get the lines correct, but miss the first one, it's usually step four. Um, Taylor, would you read step four? If you believe the lines actually in for question one, then carefully articulate that answer using different words from those, or using words from those lines. Remember, question three, multiple lines offer an answer, don't answer, still differ, and only one of those options will be offered. Okay, so we're going to walk through all of the steps, and then we're going to be especially careful with step four. Again, if you get the lines correct, but the answer wrong, usually it's because you didn't articulate the answer using specific words from those lines. I know they're not going to use those exact words in, in the answer, but they'll be synonymous, they'll be figurative, they'll be broadly saying roughly the same thing. So, let's, the first question is, how would we describe Mrs. Q? How does the passage describe Mrs. Q from point to perspective of? Anything in the passage, so that's nice. About Mrs. Q, this is easy. How do we describe Mrs. Q? So uh, Taylor, would you read the lines uh, that you chose which are correct in 10, which is what, what answer? D. D, so let's go read 77 to 82 because none of the other lines are actually describing Mrs. Q. She was one of those imperfectly self-assured individuals who are seriously opposed, uh, who are magnificent and autocratic, as long as they are not seriously opposed. The least show of unexpected resistance goes a long way towards rendering them proud and, and apologetic. So again, some vocab you might trip up over. Let's go focus on the words you know and use those words. From those words and those lines, everybody, how would you describe Mrs. Q? The words you know. Self-assured. She's self-assured. Mm -hmm. What else? Magnificent. She's magnificent. Autocratic. Do we know autocratic? If we know autocratic, that means she's bossy? I don't know. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, I thought it might have said that autocratic means like kind of autocratic means literally. Um, auto self rule, self rule, is one person ruling. <clears throat> but let's focus on what we know, which is which is again self assured, magnificent. What? How else do we describe her? Self assured, magnificent. Mm -hmm. Cow -like. Cow we know cowed. If we don't know cowed, Cow. at least you know the next word, which is apologetic, apologetic when opposed. Okay. So she's magnificent. She's self-assured, but she apologizes if you oppose her. Let's 
take those words and go see what happens in night. A, superficially kind. None of this says anything about kind. I don't like that word. And I don't like selfish either. And, and a, a magnificent, self-assured, and apologize when you're opposed doesn't mean that you're kind or selfish. Neither part of that answer works for me. Let's go to B. Outwardly imposing. Well, that would be the magnificent, self-assured, right? Does that match? What about easily defied? Can you defy her? Well, if you oppose her, she apologizes. I think that's my answer. But let's go on. Let's go on to see. Socially successful. Magnificent. Maybe, yeah. Self-assured, I think so. I think that can match. Uh, bitter? Bitter? No, that's a real strong degree, and it's, uh, I don't get bitter in here at all. Naturally generous. I got no generosity in there at all from magnificent, self-assured, or apologizing. Did you? Yeah. Even no matter what imprudent means. Do we know what imprudent means? It means not prudent. Uh, just kidding. Uh, it means not wise. Prudent is, is basically wise. Um, yeah, so let me now go back to nine and ask, what did you pick for nine? No, that's right. I want to know what was it that you picked from nine that you can now look at and go, ah, okay, that that I should have been able to rule that out. I didn't like pick it. Oh, you didn't pick it. I got the same one wrong, but I got ten right, and I picked B instead of C. Because the socially successful yeah. is there, but you should have been worried about the degree of bitter. You should look at yeah. bitter and go, that's kind of harsh. Yeah. Right. If, 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 she was, if she was bitter, it should show in the language, and I didn't see any word that it recognized that could connect with bitter, right? Yeah. So that would have been a degree of warning. Okay. All right. Uh, any other thoughts or questions on those? Let's continue. Next passage. I heard 14. Now, interesting about 14 is it's part of a tandem pair, but it's also a big picture question. Yeah. So I, you could use either strategy on this one. Yes? No, that's what I was thinking. You sure? Yeah, I have to use this one. Oh, okay. okay. So uh, we'll follow up with 14. We'll follow up with you after 14. So how do you want to approach this? I, I could use either strategy here. I might try both just to make sure I get them both right, but let's try the big picture strategy first. Um, central idea. I'm going to read 35 to 57. That's okay. It doesn't have to be like this. Uh, I might stop and go, wait, what doesn't have to be like this? I might need to go read outside those lines to better understand them. Um, what they're talking about is the. Um, a public transportation situation. It doesn't have to be like this. Done, I mean, that's such a short sentence, I'm gonna read the next one for sure. Done right, public transport can be faster, more comfortable, and cheaper than the private automobile. Okay, so far this, the central idea is that public transport doesn't have to be bad, it can be good. And then I go read the last. Let's read the last sentence uh, or two of, let's see, where should we start? Uh, well, all the way at line 53. Yeah. And some cities have transformed their streets into cycle-free pathways, making giant strides in public health. And yeah, so we're just giving an example of how it could be good, mm -hmm. what we could do to make it good. So to me, the central idea, nice and broad, is gonna be public transportation doesn't have to be bad, it could be good, here's an example. And then I look at European countries, time out, I'm already getting, isn't this a little specific, European? I need broad in general, don't I? I didn't get European in first and last, did you? Uh, some public transportation systems are superior to travel by private automobile. I think that's kind of what it's saying. I like that. Uh, let me go look at the others. Americans should mimic 
foreign public transportation. That's applying a value judgment, and it's a little stronger degree. What does mimic mean? Absolutely copy. And I don't think that's the point. It's, a, it's, it's about here's some ways we could go, and the mimic and the it is getting a little bit strong, a little bit specific. I prefer B because it's broader. And then much international public transportation is engineered for passengers who work while on board. Uh, that's the last one had people riding bicycles. That'd be pretty tough, <laughs> right? I mean, unless you're riding with no hands and stuff. Hands free. Yeah, so just applying the big picture, I like B. But let's now consider the tandem. What's the best evidence that would actually answer that question? It doesn't have to be like this. That just means it doesn't have to be bad. That doesn't mean that it's good. I don't think there's enough there. 35 to 37, I think that's exactly what I was looking for in terms of my first and last, which is where I expected my evidence to be in the first place, right, for a big picture question. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what I was saying. Okay. All right. <coughs> uh, before that? 12 and 13. Okay, let's walk through this. Which choice does the author explicitly, let's make sure we know what explicit versus implicit is. Explicit means? Says it, not exactly verbatim, but at least with synonyms. It says it directly. And um, implicit means, well, they said something that you could easily draw that conclusion from. So explicit as an advantage of automobile travel. Point of view? Author. Author. About? Advantage of automobile. Other disqualifiers? Well, it better be explicit, and it better be, that's the degree, and it better be about North America in particular. So we go to read the lines. Five to nine. In other words, traveling to work, school, or the market means being a strap hanger, somebody, yeah, that, that doesn't give me an advantage of the automobile, nor does it say anything explicit or North America. I would put a hard strike on A. Uh, number B, numbers 20 to 24, and yet public transportation in many minds is the opposite of glamour, a squalid resort, a squalid last resort for those with one too many impaired driving charges, too poor to afford insurance, or too decrepit to get. Hey, that's that's people's opinion about the wrong thing. It's not about advantage of automobile. It's about what's negative about public transport. So it's not about the right thing. All right, um, twenty-four to twenty-six. In much of North America, okay, now we're in the right place at least, right? Oh, they are right. Taking transit is depressing experience. Is that where it ends? Yeah. I don't get an advantage of the automobile. All right, so to me, I've got hard strikes on A, B, and C. I must be just as hard on B as I was on A, B, and C. If I don't like B, I have to strike it and I have to go rethink. I would rather you do that then try to make everything else fit earlier, because you had the wrong point uh, about, you might have had the right perspective, but it means you might have had about, about the wrong thing. Um, well, let's go test 32 to 34. Given the opportunity, who wouldn't drive? Hopping in a car almost always gets you to your destination more quickly, so there's the advantage of the car that was about the right thing, and it says, what is that advantage? You get there quicker. Mm -hmm. And in 12, the only thing that says you get there quicker is speed. So um, if you think about the lines, but as I walked through, right, as I walked through the strategy, reading those lines. I thought it was convenient. Well, let me, but so. Yeah, yeah, convenient. Yeah, getting there faster. So let's go back to the word explicit then. You are absolutely right, because this is one of the things we have to be careful on with questions in general, not just the tandem pairs, but the questions in general, right? Yeah. It says explicit, 
But what you said is true. It would be more convenient, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's definitely more convenient. Be, getting there quicker, that would be implicit, yes. Okay. It would definitely get you there more, uh, uh, it would be definitely more convenient. But that's a true statement that doesn't answer the question, which is what's the explicit? The explicit is use those words from those lines quicker. If it says implicit, wouldn't it be then Yeah. Yeah, if it, you're, it's a good point. If it said implicit instead of explicit, then convenient would have been would have been uh, implied. Got it. So beware, beware true statements that don't exactly answer the question. That's one of their favorite traps. All right. Next. All right, so when, this is very important. I might have mentioned it last time. I want to state, state it again. When they ask you to interpret data, what's the first thing you need to read? The heading. Why? We need to clarify what exactly are we measuring. Because they're going to use words with numbers that match, but don't measure the right thing. I'll give you an example in this answer. Uh, let me see what they have here. Ah, what's wrong with D? How many picked D? Anyone picked D? What's the timing disqualifier in D? What's the one word that you go, oh, that, that makes it, that's not what it's measuring. Often, the oftenness is not what's measured. We don't measure how often they take it. So that's got to be, you know, that's part of getting sensitive to your timing disqualifier. Oh, often is a timing word. I should be careful with that. So what are we actually measuring? The percentage of people who, uh, of types of people who do use public transportation by occupation. And so we can make quantity statements, not absolute numbers, but comparative numbers because percentage we can, we can say, well, there are more of these people than those people by percentage. We can't, we can't make any statement about actual real numbers of people, but just comparative. Um, so that's, that's the issue that would help me to say, well, D cannot be the answer. I'm not going to get trapped by D. Um, and did anyone pick a different one other than D that was wrong? Okay, so the, the timing the timing word is the big takeaway there. All right, next. It's twenty-one. Two. Bless you. Which choice best reflects the overall sequence of events in the passage? Well, when we're talking of sequence of events, I'm concerned that my big picture question strategy might be missing something in the middle. But I'm still going to try it. I'm still going to apply it because it is still a big picture question. I'm going to go read first and last and see what happens. Uh, in the blurb, we get scientists have debated how the answers to birds evolved, the ability to fly, round of theory assumes that they were fleet footed ground dwellers that captured prey by leaping and flapping their upper limbs. The tree down assumes they were tree climbers that. Um, leapt and glided among branches. All right. So there's the big issue is the debate of how uh, birds learn how to fly or whatever. What was it called again? Ground up, tree down. And the first paragraph talks about a guy named Ken Dial. Just to save time, I'm going to cut through quick, more quickly. Ken Dial, he's a researcher. And a professor and his students said, hey, why don't, you, why don't you address this? And so he designs a, a project. He designs a um, yeah, project to see if he could get some more insight into how this happens. And then the very end, we see that he has done a project. They must have described it in the body. And this, this WAIR is kind of a result of of, of a technique, uh, what, how he describes the technique with 
one fell swoop, the dials came up with a viable origin. So something about the project that he was inspired to do helped him come up with a, a viable theory. So big picture, he designs a project, project seems to be okay, he, he's able from the project to be able to come up with um, a viable theory. A, an experiment is proposed but proves unworkable. A less ex ambitious experiment is attempted and it yields data that gives rise to a new set of questions. Um, I have, without reading the body, I don't know if there was one experiment than another. But I don't like the last part of that. Because are we ending with a new set of questions? No, we're ending up with a theory based on something successful in the project. So I don't like the last part of A. I'm using my filters to say, no, I don't see set of questions. I see quantity issue, because I don't see questions. And I see perspective issue, because it's not questions, it's I got a theory. Does that make sense? I don't, I don't like it. A new discovery leads to the reconsideration of a theory. A classical study is updated, and the results are summarized. I still don't get a new theory. The WAIR seems to be important in the end. Um, I don't know if there was a new discovery, because not from the body, but I don't like the ending again. C, an anomaly is observed and simulated experimental. Uh, do we know what an anomaly is? No. Mm, that might have caused some... Yeah. Pardon me? It's an outlier. An outlier. Ah, non, not the norm not the norm, anomaly. Uh, but anyway, if we didn't know that, it's observed and simulated experimentally. The results are compared with previous findings and a novel hypothesis. Now the last part could be, you know, um, attractive. I like that there's a, a new hypothesis. But that first part is, I'm not sure. Last one, an unexpected finding arises during the early phase of a study well, I know there's going to be a study. Um, I don't know if there is uh, unexpected finding or not. The study is modified in response, and the results are interpreted and evaluated. Yeah. The first and last strategy here shows its limitations when they ask you about sequence event, events in the middle. So I don't like A and I don't like B. I'm not sure about C and D. I would have to, I would maybe hold off on this go answer all my other questions, and then maybe I've read enough, I can come back and answer it. How many of you got this one wrong? How many of you picked C? So if you got it wrong, you picked A or B? So do you see do you see why we uh, I didn't like A or B? What, what we should have been concerned about with B? Actually, actually, going back, a new discovery leads to you know what I actually what I like least about B is the first part. But I think A. Mm -hmm. So to me, to me, the most important part in A that we should disqualify is that set of questions is not at the end. All right, so th no, that's a good point. Um, we we're going to find out that he starts. If we go into paragraph two, we find out that he has launched a, a, a study or experiment, and he finds something out. Some rancher has to tell him, you know, that doesn't make sense. They need to be on perches, and um, so he adjusts it, and that's why an unexpected finding. He adjusts it, he modifies it, and then the results are interpreted and evaluated. Why we're going to have. And, and again, anomaly, if we knew anomaly, that would be a disqualifier there. It's not the norm? No. There's no anomaly observed. He just didn't know because he's not a, he's a, he's a city slicker, he's not a country guy. Anyone here ever raise chickens or anything like that? They want to be a perch? They don't flock but they want to be on perches. Right? Well, 
Although I will say this, if your German Shepherd gets loose and the chickens, they fly. They, at least to get to the top of a house or something to get away from the... That's happening. Anyway, yes? 23. 23. Okay, in combination with 24. Did you get 24 right? Okay, so let's, let's walk through the town. Listen, we're in the early stages of the training, or mid-stages, but, but we're just getting more practice with these tandem pairs, and they are the toughest to manage of all the questions. So let's walk through, let's get practice at applying this, this strategy successfully. Step one, what is that original question? Right, and so to make it even more concise for me, I'm not going to say which statement best captures. Yeah, what's Kendall's central assumption? Point of view? About? His assumption. Other disqualifiers in the question, this is critical. Sorry? Well, that's a point of view of Ken Dial, Ken Dial about his assumption. Time and quantity degree issues? Uh, well, it's a singular assumption. during when he's setting it up. What? When he's setting it up. When he's setting it up. This is a timing disqualifier. I don't know if you caught that as a timing disqualifier, but it is. It had to be an assumption when? He was setting it up. So if you underline in setting it up, that to me is going to save you on this. Because there's some answers here that look plausible, but you must disqualify because it's not when he was setting it up. So let's go to lines one to four and see if we can find point of view, Ken Dial, about his assumption when setting it up. One to four. At field sites around the world, Ken Dial saw a pattern of how young pheasants, and quail, and tinamous, and other ground birds ran along behind their parents. Is he setting up research? No. Or, yeah, timing's off, and I don't even know what his assumption is. So, a couple of problems. 6 to 11. Um... So when a group of graduate students challenged him to come up with new data on the age-old ground-up tree-down debate, he designed a project. Hey, is he setting up research? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Timing is good. To see what clues might lie about how baby game birds learn to fly. Okay, so his central assumption would be that he could learn how baby game birds learn to fly. By, by doing, uh, you know, uh, addressing the ground up tree down debate, roughly speaking. So I think it provides an answer, and the answer would be that he can determine how baby game birds learn how to fly. So Ace in number 23 says, the acquisition of flight young birds shed light on the flight of their evolutionary ancestors. Ah. I knew it wouldn't say it directly, but the age-old ground-up tree-down debate is the evolutionary ancestors. So I think this match. I think this matches. I'm probably going to go check my other answers. Let's go read lines 16 and 19. When the cowboys stopped to see how things were going, Ken Dow showed him his nice, tidy laboratory setup and explained how the birds first hops and flights would be measured. Is he setting up his research? He's in the middle of the research. Timing disqualifiers. 23 to 24. They hate to be on the ground, give them something to climb on. It's not from Kendall's point of view has to be what we already identified then. I wanted to go check those other lines just to make sure. You know, if you have time, I highly recommend you read all of the sets of lines. If you don't have time, you think you have an answer, and you're confident you caught all of your disqualifiers, then move on. Next. Yeah, 
like 27 could be one of the hardest ones to, um, to answer because you're not given any frame of reference of where to look. Mm -hmm. But these kind of questions, the answers are usually pretty direct right in the text. The challenge is to find where it says exactly that. Yeah. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty direct. There's not going to be like, oh, I had to really make some connections. It, it'll say it directly. And can anyone tell us where to look, what lines? It's, it gives the answer pretty directly. I think it's line 50. Yeah. Yeah, line 50. They end there flapping down and backward. Yeah. And that position of the wings help them to get up the ramp. Yeah, it, it's those kind of questions where they don't tell you where to look. The answer is almost always very, very direct. It's just you got to find it. Okay. The needle in the haystack. Twenty nine and thirty. Did we get thirty? Yeah. I don't know why. I feel like everybody talks about twenty nine and thirty. Well, it's it, it's probably in step four. You got to use words. Looking right. We're looking at twenty nine thirty. Oh, I got one. I got the other two. Did you get the first or the second one correct? I got uh, thirty correct, but not twenty nine. And that's what Lily, that's what uh, Lily said. Yeah, I didn't hear what she said. I was too busy focusing no, no, on twenty-seven. I don't know why. I was like staring no, 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 at but, <laughs> but the problem then happens at the same level, probably step four. So <clears throat> what's the first question? What can we infer about gliding animals? Point of view? Passage. The passage. That's nice and gentle. We can get this from it can be Ken Dial, it could be one of the students, it could be a rancher who comes, we don't care. This is, it kind of makes it easier. <clears throat> about what? About gliding. Gliding animals. I don't see any timing. I do see quantity. Better be plural, right? Singular plural, be sensitive. It turns out singular plural is not going to be an issue here. But you need to be sensitive to that. You need to spot it. It better be gliding animals and not one. Uh, <clears throat> unless they use that one uh, animal as an example for all gliding animals, then, then it could apply. Um, right. What can we say about gliding animals? Nice, easy question. And to save us some time, let's go right to the lines which you found. Olivia, would you read the lines that you found correct? Well, I got 30 wrong, but Taylor oh, got it right. Okay. So Taylor, you got you had the 30 right. I had 30 right, but Okay. okay. The two of you can work together. We'll get uh, uh, 800 on this. <laughs> um, so read the lines that you found, Taylor. So I found 22 to 24. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me point two things out. Number one, this is the only set of lines that makes any reference whatsoever to gliding animals. So there's no reason to pick anything else but, uh, is it D? Yeah, D in number 30. No reason. Every other one is about the wrong thing. This is the only one that's about gliding animals. We really shouldn't miss 30. Now, now that we have it, something gliding animals don't do. What? What are they referring to? This is one of the subtleties of the, of the tandem pairs. To better understand these lines, sometimes we have to read outside these lines because they reach back to something else and bring it into these lines. In other words, the answer has to be in these lines, but they might be referring to something outside these lines that then, that then comes in. So we have to go outside these lines to find out what is it that they don't do? What is this thing that they don't do it's referring to something outside these lines. And what is it that, that, that gliding animals don't do? Flapping their wings. So therein, the answer is still in these lines, but it has reached back outside of those lines to bring that fact into these lines. Mm -hmm. So there's your answer, they don't flap their wings. Yeah, I think she was telling her one. I think I thought like,
Well, I don't know. Did you? To me, the key here might be just noticing where it says something they don't do. You got to go. Well, what is the something they don't do? And go back and, and read that. So the takeaway might be. I'm not 100 percent, but the takeaway might be best for you. Make sure if there is any reference to anything outside those lines, you go read that because that's a part of your answer. Okay. Next. Number 32. Well, did we get 33? Yeah. Okay, so again, uh, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but nine times out of 10, if you got the lines correct, but the first answer wrong, it's because you're not using, you're not being OCD about using words from those lines. So let's get the question, it is, what does author passage one believe about running a household and raising children? Point of view, author, about running a household and raising children. It has to be both. Now, if you would literally read the lines that you chose. It is not apparent that there are delicate constitutions, there are peaceful inclinations. Who are they? Do I need to read outside this just to make sure I know who they are? In context, I think it's pretty obvious that They're different women. to women. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'll just kind of read them. It is not apparent that there are delicate constitutions, there are peaceful inclinations, and there are many duties of motherhood. Set them apart from the strenuous habit. Motherhood? Is that raising children? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, that's covered. Some strenuous habits and onerous duties, and some of them to gentle occupations and the cares of the home. Cares of the home? Is that running a household? Yeah. Okay, so it's got it's about the right thing, mm -hmm. and it's from the author. Now there's some language in there that you might not get, that if you knew it would make it extra easy. However, focus on the words. What, did you know? what words in there do you know? Um. Strenuous and onerous are great words. If we don't catch those later on, what are the last uh, the last little bit there? Gentle. Other other language in in the whole other language. Other than gentle, what else do you recognize? Delicate. Peaceful, delicate, gentle. Apparent. Sorry. Apparent. Apparently. Well, apparently it's peaceful, gentle, and delicate. Those are the the uh, descriptors of running a household and raising children. So I'm going to take peaceful, gentle, delicate, and go see A, rewarding for men. Oh. No, it's not about men. B, yield less value to society than a, It's not about men again. Why do men keep showing up? It, uh, it's delicate, peaceful, gentle. Until very few activities that are difficult and pleasant. Okay, that's kind of stating gentle, peaceful, and delicate in the negative, right? So maybe, require skills similar to those needed to run a country or business. No, got to be C, where they're giving you the answer kind of in the negative. The answer is peaceful, gentle, delicate. The answer given is not difficult, not unpleasant. Well, that would make them peaceful, gentle, delicate. And that's one of their faves kind of stating the answer in the negative. Yeah. Okay. But if you stick to the words in those lines, you yeah. will land on the right answer. I know, I need to do that one. Next. Mm -hmm. 38. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> 38. All right, so this is the 10 pair. Uh, 6165, the author of passage 2 refers to a statement in passage 1 in order to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, just based on the fact that this is a parallel uh, passages, and that the topic of conversation is a women's rights, women's suffrage, right? That the author of passage 2 is going to quote something from passage 1 to say you're an idiot. Uh, maybe not that harshly, right? Okay, so to call into question 
I like call into question the qualifications of the author. I'm not sure about the qualifications. To me, that's my big issue is the word qualification. I don't like that. I, I can't prove it or disprove it yet. I haven't even looked at it. But I'm just, I'm just going based on the fact that I know there's going to be disagreement. I like to call into question, but I'm worried about the word qualifications of the author. By the way, you do know that that's a bad argument, right? The appeal to authority in, 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 when you're debating. You, the appeal to authority doesn't... Who are you to speak the truth? Well, the truth is the truth. It doesn't matter who I am, right? So, anyway. So I don't like qualifications. But let's move forward. Dispute. Possibly. The assertion made about women? Maybe. It looks plausible. Develop her argument? I like that. By highlighting what she sees as flawed reasoning? I like that too. So far, B and C look reasonable as possible answers without having read anything. Validate the concluding declarations made by the authors of passage one? No! How can I agree? B should be found. There's no way she's going to agree with them, right? Just based on the topic. Because what happens in these parallel passages, guys, 90% of the time, first author defends status quo. What's status quo? The way things are in 17, 1800, whatever. Defend status quo. Passage two, argue for change. That's usually what happens, right? So D, 100% no. A, I don't like qualifications. It had to be between B and C. Who picked B? Good. So if you pick B, I can't pick between B and C until I read. Uh, so it's more plausible. If you pick A or D, hopefully you know why we have to throw those out. Um, so the answer, I listen, I'm quoting you. Because can't you see what you just said would lead you to my conclusion instead of yours? That's why it's going to be C. So would that be a strong challenge? Yeah, I guess I would agree. Oh, the, over, the overall relationship between them is they strongly disagree. I'm expecting strong contrast, right? So. Strongly challenges. I like that. I like that. B. Draws alternative conclusions. Well, that's, that's a disagreement. But it's not to the degree I would expect for this topic. Right? So I, I like the degree for A. I don't like the degree for B. Elaborates on the proposal. Yes, you propose something, and I'm just going to talk more about it. No, no, no. I'm going to basically tell you you're wrong. There's no contrast at all in C. Restate what that person said? No way. I'm not just going to... C and D have to be thrown out because that has uh, author passage 2 agreeing with passage 1, right? Without having read a single thing, I would pick A all day long if you told me it was about women's suffrage or about slavery or about the founding documents or any one of these issues that you know there's going to be, they're going to be butting heads. Make sense? Without even having read it, I would pick A all day. Next. This one's a little tricky. Uh, 43 says, author, be, author states that a certain hypothesis can best be tested by a trial. Um, based on the passage, which of the following is the hypothesis the author suggested? Okay, so the, so the actual question is, what does the author, okay. what hypothesis does the author suggest Testing. What, what hypothesis do the authors suggest be tested in a trial specifically? Point of view, uh, the authors, about the hypothesis they suggest be tested. 
since you have the lines, read those lines for me. Um, without least intimate and feeling on the peripheral producing plants tree colonies are susceptible to mite infestation, which can become fatal either directly or due to secondary infection of immunocom immunocompromised or nutritionally deficient bees. That's a mouthful. So what are the words in that answer? How many of you did get this one right? Okay, so what are the words in the lines that you can use to connect to your correct answer in 43? So we need to test if the pyrethrum yeah. is related to mite infestation mm -hmm. or susceptibility? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so the answer in 43, which one says that? Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the, eating, the feeding on the pyrethrums and Resistance to mite infestation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one did you pick in 43? Um, I picked B, but it doesn't go to So let's look at, specific. yeah, so let's look at B and what would, what words could disqualify, what words are in option B that should really disqualify? And it's not talking about insecticides either. Mm -hmm. There's no even oblique reference to insecticides. The mite, the mite infestations is there, but I would say insecticides would rule it out. And like you said, si uh, single crop. Yeah. I think I was reading. Yeah, I don't know. I picked A, which was good. Okay, what, what is it? Uh, everyone who got it right, what is it in A that we should look at and, and say this could disqualify A? Yeah, and is there is there reference to bacteria and fungus in there? No. Um, Yeah, the bacterium and fungus is not the issue, and it's not about being exposed to both them. It's about if you're exposed to the pyrethrum, will the mites follow or not? So you might even call that a timing issue, right? It's about how, how does pyrethrum accessibility affect the mites which would come after, and not both simultaneous. Could be a bit of a timing issue. Okay, next. Forty-six. Forty-six and forty-five. The passage most strongly suggests that beekeepers attempt attempts to fight mite infestations with commercially produced insecticides have what intentional effect? Okay, point of view. The passage about the unintentional effect of fighting mite infestation with commercially produced insecticides. Okay. Um, I don't see really other disqualifiers. It's insecticides, plural. That's fine. Uh, so who got 50, 46 correct? All right, so uh, let me ask. Johanna, would you please read uh, the lines for me in 46? What lines are they? 31 to 35. Okay, so it's got to be, again, about unintentional effect of trying to fight mite infestation with 
insecticide. And if they're sharing it in meat only, immune compromised or nutritionally deficient beef, maybe further weakened by commercially produced insecticides, are introduced into their hives by beekeepers in an effort to fight mite infestation. So that's absolutely about the right thing, in an effort to fight mite infestation, the insecticide. And, and what would be the, before you look at their answers, using these words, what would be the uh, unintentional effect? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we go up to 45, using those words, which one says that? Yeah, D says it broadly, can further, can further harm them. Then get specific with the Immunocompromised or the uh, what was the other one? Di what? what deficiency? There's it. Immunocomp nutrition. or nutritionally deficient. Yeah. So it doesn't it doesn't say those specifically. It says it more broadly. It could harm them. Anything else? Fifty two. So one more time, read what are we actually measuring? What are we measuring? Pathogen, no, no, reading the top, we read pathogen occurrence in honeybee colonies with and without collapse disorder. We're just measuring percentage of colonies affected by a pathogen. That's all we're measuring. So, is there any connection in this data to mites? No. So we have to say no because it does. Um, we don't know if the mites are there even. So what we're measuring does not include mites. So I think we have some really important takeaways. Hopefully this will sink in, and we're going to get better at applying the strategy. Let's take a quick break, and then we'll be back here to talk about math.